Hello, I'm Lugatorix, and welcome to my Eastern Roman Empire faction guide for Rome Total War Barbarian Invasion. Today we're going to be discussing some campaign strategy for the Eastern Roman Empire. We're going to have a look at their units and basically just talk about the campaign as a whole and the faction. I did this for all the factions in the Rome Total War base game as well as the Medieval 2 base game and now I'm going to do it for Barbarian Invasion starting off with the Eastern Roman Empire. So, as you can see, the Eastern Roman Empire starts off in the dark purple regions of the map. The light purple regions are the ones that you need to hold. So you don't start off in Northern Italy, that's one you need to take uh, in order to actually complete the campaign, but we'll talk about that in a second. The difficulty factor is estimated moderate. I would say that's actually a fairly, well I, I would say it's an, a bit of an underestimation of how difficult the campaign is. For experienced players, maybe not too difficult, but in the early stages, bear in mind you are quite surrounded and actually is a little bit more difficult than moderate, in my opinion anyway. Uh, so there we go. It's basically the sort of origins of the Byzantine Empire, if you're wondering. That's kind of why they're starting off in this region. And of course, Rome, if you haven't played this game before, is split between these guys and the Western Roman Empire, which I'll be doing a faction guide on very, very soon. That is a tough campaign for sure. But today we're going to be fo focusing on the purple guys. So in order to complete the campaign, you have to hold 34 settlements, including Thracia, Egyptus, I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong, uh, this region here, Northern Italy and Africa which is this route, and apparently that's called Africa. So that's what you have to do to complete the campaign. The game says that it has a strong mixture of troops, few weak units. I, again, would argue that there are actually a few weak units, but, you know, maybe maybe I'm being a little bit harsh on the faction. I'm not sure. So let's just get in straight into it and talk about some of the units that the Eastern Roman Empire have. So these are the units for the Eastern Roman Empire, and we're going to get straight into it. We're going to get started with peasants and well as is pretty typical of total war games particularly rome total wars we're talking about it peasants are not exactly amazing attack of two defense of five poor morale really don't use these guys for any much more than just garrisoning settlements they're never going to be attacked if you rely on these guys in the heat of battle they're very likely to break down because of that poor morale and they're going to let you down obviously most people are not going to use peasants on the front line but just in case you didn't know, they're pretty trash. They're basically better for farming. Leave them to do that. Then we have an interesting unit, the Orthodox Priest. Priests inspire nearby troops to acts of great bravery through their prayers and blessings. Not really sure how much that would work in real life, but maybe it would. Now, these guys obviously are clearly not fighters. Attack of one, defense of three, poor morale is actually worse than the peasants. And um, their unit has 24 men as opposed to 120 on this unit scale. But obviously they're not used... Uh, for actually attacking. What they are good at is their sort of chant, prayer, whatever you want to call it, inspires nearby troops and it helps improve their morale. And of course, morale is such an important part of Rome Total War. really is the, the difference maker um, because if a unit can hold on for that little bit of time, maybe just in time for a cavalry charge or just in time so they can get a few more jabs in at their sword or their spears or whatever, it's going to turn the tide of a battle massively in your favour. So to have an orthodox priest, to have any unit that will raise the morale of other troops is a good unit in my opinion. But obviously these guys are not fighters, they're priests, they're not really meant to be fighting on the battlefield. Then we're going to get on to Limitane. I think I'm saying that right, Limitane. Now, these guys, I've always thought is an odd unit because on paper, they look pretty solid. Nothing amazing, but pretty solid indeed. These are spearmen with an attack of four. Nothing amazing, but they're a defensive troop and a defense of 17. Now, 17 defense, pretty damn solid. That's, you know, nothing to be scoffed at at all. And they have a missile attack of eight, which in the base game for Rome Total War, spearmen to have a missile attack is, I think there's not a single unit with a missile attack spear. It's very, very rare at the very least. So you look at them, you think they're defensive. They've got a little bit of a punch to them because they can throw peeler or whatever. They're going to be pretty solid. And you know what? Sometimes they can be solid. But honestly, these guys will let you down more than they'll save the day. If you think, oh, these guys will be able to hold in the heat of a battle, hold the front line, honestly, their morale is garbage. I mean, they are really only just a small step up from peasants in terms of morale. Honestly, I've seen these guys break in the face of peasants sometimes. Now, I'm, I'm talking particularly on very hard, very hard difficulty. That's why I play on uh, very hard, very hard difficulty. On lower difficulties, I would imagine these guys are significantly better because morale is less of a factor as you go down the difficulty. But if you're talking about the top difficulty levels, these guys just will not stand up. I mean, they the amount of times they have disappointed me in battle. 
honestly, it, 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 it's, it's unfathomable how disappointing these guys can be. Do not have high expectations of these spearmen that are going to hold up like a phalanx in Rome Toads War. It's nothing like that, okay? They will break. They will break. Now, they can be useful in some instances. If you want to hold a tight city street, and maybe you're fighting some pretty rubbish units as well, then they're good. They do, um, they do have a combat bonus in woods. I don't know really how useful that is in reality, but... Hey, I don't know, it could be a little bit useful. You know, if they want to hold a plaza or something like that, maybe where they have infinite morale, then they would be a more useful unit. But, as I said, really do not think that these are some wondrous spearmen. They certainly are not. Rant over. Let's move on. Okay, now we're going to get on to the Comet Tenses, which are better. Comet Tenses are certainly better. So, they are mobile field forces of the late Roman Empire. It is their task to meet enemies on the field not to be garrisons on the frontier. So that well, pretty much summarizes it well. They're a more offensive troop, even though they have a defense of 25. Now, a defense of 25, again, pretty damn solid. That's a good defense. These guys are well armored. It says there they're well armored. They have a missile attack of nine with their like peeler, which is good. That's pretty similar to the Limitane, but that means that they are more effective, not just in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but actually they have a little bit of range to them, which is cool. An attack of eight is nothing particularly amazing. Honestly, they don't pack a huge punch, but they will do an okay job. They'll do a pretty solid job, actually, uh, in the battle. It's a shame they don't pack more of a punch. Some of the, you know, sort of late-game units, uh, some of the Barbarian units can really pack a punch. These guys will not do that. But the fact they are well-armored and you can get them pretty early on in the campaign is a good thing. Next up, Plumbatarii. I think I'm saying that right. Again, sorry if I'm not. Um, attack of 8, defense of 25, completely identical to the combat tensors. Um, missile attack of 10, so very slightly better. They're also well-armored, good stamina. Obviously, they use a missile weapon before charging. They are Roman legionaries who have been armed with iron darts. They can hurl with deadly effect and yet can still fight hand to hand with enemy units. Again, you know, you know what? Pretty solid unit. I'm not. I don't hate these guys too much. Uh, indeed, they don't pack a huge punch in the melee, much like the combat tent says. They're pretty similar, to be honest. They're just more. Um, Combat tenses are more melee focused, whereas these guys are more missile focused. Missile attack of ten is okay for sort of javelin man type units. You know, missile units that aren't archers but are also infantry so not too bad at all good stamina good stamina is a nice trait particularly for throwing javelin men because they're going to be doing much more running around and skirmishing than other units but also a unit that has low energy is more likely to break and their morale is going to go down quicker so it is essentially an, a morale boosting thing in the long term they're going to have more morale because they're not going to get tired as quickly as other troops on the battlefield but again these guys are kind of like javelin men so you would expect for them to have good good stamina that isn't anything hugely special well armored though that is quite special next up combat tenses first cohort the mobile field forces of the late roman empire these men are entrusted with a legionary standard. So, attack of 10, a little bit more punch to them, which is nice. They have their, is that Gladius the, the sword is called? I shouldn't guess these things. I think it is anyway. Uh, attack of 10, missile attack of 11. So, comparable to the previous units. In fact, a little bit higher. Charge bonus of 3 is underrated. Defense of 27. 27 is quite high indeed. Um, uh, but what I particularly like about these guys is the legionary standard, the eagle, as the game calls it. The eagle inspires nearby troops. And like I was saying earlier with the orthodox priest, any unit that can inspire nearby troops is good because it's going to raise the morale of your whole army. You're going to be able to fight for longer. But also these guys are actually very, very competent in fighting themselves, whereas obviously the orthodox priests are not. But you're, it's going to take a while for you guys, um, for you to be able to actually get these guys, obviously. So, use a missile attack, which is pretty cool. Again, they've got a bit of range to them. Good morale, which is the first unit I think we've seen with good morale. So these guys are going to stand up and fight, even if they don't have a huge, huge punch, because 10 attack isn't amazing. It's still pretty solid. And coupled with the defense of 27, good morale means these guys can fight and stand up to a fair amount. Certainly a lot more than these guys. I have a bit of a sort of thing about Limitani. They just, they just disappointed me, man. Anyway, anyway. Uh, yeah, charge bonus of three, good stamina, well, very well armoured, so that is actually better than these guys. Very well armoured, meaning that they're going to be way less vulnerable to missiles, or, uh, you know, uh, at the very least, non-armour-piercing missiles. They're going to be, you know, infinitely less vulnerable um, to missiles, which is cool. They can stand up to a lot, and they'll actually have more men in a unit as well. 81 as opposed to 122, so 40 more men on this unit scale anyway, means that there's going to be a lot more that you have to kill and a lot more doing damage in each unit. So that's pretty cool indeed. Then we're going to get on to the Legio Lanciari. Lanciarii? Lanciari? I'm sorry. Uh, they are spear-armed legionaries, a force of 
with some of the elite status of Imperial Guards as well as spears they can also carry javelins making them a handy force for any Roman commander. 6 attack, 19 defence, 10 missile, pretty similar to what I was saying before, I'm not going to keep repeating myself but this is a, it's a better unit than the flipping Limitane for sure, that's cool. But, and their missile attack is better. I mean, it's basically a sort of less disappointing version of the Liam Tane is what I would say. But the javelins, pretty cool stuff. I love the fact the spearmen have javelins. It makes them just more useful than ever. It's really, really cool. Now we're going to get on to the archers. Now these are the standard archers, which have a attack melee attack of 2 and melee defense of 6. Nothing too special, but obviously these guys are not going to be fighting in the melee. Really, if you've got to the stage of a battle where you're fighting... With these guys in the melee, you've probably lost it already. Now, missile attack of 5 is nothing particularly special. It's lower than the missile attack of these guys, obviously. But, obviously, again, these guys have the much longer range missiles because they're not peeler or javelins or whatever you call them. So, archers, pretty similar, honestly, to the standard base game Roman archers. They will do an okay job, pretty solid job indeed. Particularly if you put them up on a hill, up on a wall, they can do a bit of damage for sure. The, the flaming missiles is good particularly for scaring troops and lowering morale which again is as I was saying earlier morale very very important indeed so these guys will do a solid job nothing amazing nothing armor piercing they're not armored themselves they, hit, they won't do that well in the melee but they will do a solid job it is nice to have a bit of long range on the battlefield that's for sure. Next up Eastern Archers so these have an attack of 4 defense of 12 now the nice thing about these guys is First of all, just looking at the first stats, the defense of 12 means that they are much less vulnerable um, in the melee if it gets to that point in the battle where you're looking and you're thinking, oh dear, things are going a little bit wrong. Well, they won't be completely slaughtered if they do have to fight hand-to-hand -hand combat because that defense of 12 isn't terrible. It's not like peasant level defense. Missile attack of 9 is pretty damn solid indeed. It's almost double of these normal base archers. So 9 missile attack pretty damn good uh, indeed long range missiles so they're going to be even long more you know further range than the normal archers these guys kind of remind me of cretans if you you know in the know in the base game long range missiles actually decent in the melee and have a quite high missile attack i'm not saying they're quite as good but the long range missiles invaluable because it means you can hit your opponent before they can hit you and it means you're already going to be getting hit already lowering the morale of the opponents before they've even seen you sometimes so very very useful unit indeed i do like my archers and these guys are pretty damn solid indeed and then we're going to move on to the equites auxilia so equites you've seen them in the base game of Rome total war these equites the stats wise are a bit better because actually they have a defense of 16 which i'm almost certainly sure definitely sure in fact that the um, equites of the base game has a much lower defense and probably a slightly lower attack as well now these guys though they are light cavalry they're not really going to be using a long slugging match they haven't got a particularly powerful charge what they are good at is first of all flanking troops quickly if you need a, a quick diverse unit that is going to be very maneuverable and agile on the battlefield then the equites will do a solid job and what i quite like the equites to do because they're fast moving like it says there is I like the fact that they can just chase down enemies at the end of a battle. If the whole army is routing, you've done a good job, but you want to make sure that they're dead because you don't want to see them again, okay? You've already had to kill them once. You don't want to see the army again. Equites will do a good job just chasing them off into the distance and, well, goodbye to your enemies, which is what we like to see. And they can swim. I mean, who likes a horse that can swim? Everyone does. Now, then we have camels, otherwise known as dromedary, I think. Uh, they are auxiliary troops recruited in the desert provinces of the Eastern Empire to take place in light cavalry uh, in scorching desert conditions. So relatively similar actually to the Equites Auxilia, but they are more accustomed to the desert. Now bear in mind you do start off in the desert, you do have um, settlements near the sort of Egypt area and um, in moving into the Middle East. It is quite cool that you get these units specifically designed for that kind of thing. They also scare horses, which is good if you're going up against some really quite good heavy cavalry that might have some heavy i'm oh sorry good morale then it's cool that you can have a unit to kind of counteract that that's pretty cool indeed i've never been hugely keen on the whole camel thing if i'm being honest i find camels a little bit slow moving they are slower moving than the equities auxilia and i also tend to find them harder to control but still these guys can do a solid job I do quite like them, um, even if they're nothing amazing. I mean, they're not going to stand up. They're not going to do a huge amount of damage in the heat of, heat of battle. But it's quite cool they can counteract the uh, difficulties of higher level cavalry that the opposition may have. Then we have 
Scole Palatine. Palatini. Oh, the Emperor's Palace Guard, a cavalry elite within the Roman army. I probably should have taken like Latin lessons before I did this video. Oh well. Eight attack, 21 defense, a charge bonus of six, good morale, well armored, good stamina. So the first thing you notice is that the defense is higher. That's cool. They're going to be able to stand up to more. Like I said, these troops are not really meant for slugging match. They're more meant for chasing and flanking. But these guys can actually pack a punch. And then once they're into an enemy, they can actually fight for a while and stand up. That coupled with the good morale and the good stamina, like I said, they're less likely to rout, less likely to break, which is huge in those crucial moments in the battle. And they're well armoured, so they're going to be less vulnerable to missiles, and also they're just going to not go down as you know easily. So that's that's pretty cool indeed. Solid unit of cavalry, that's for sure. Then we have the big boys, Equites Cataphractarii. Catafra Basically, these are cataphracts. If you remember in the base game of Rome Total War, I keep referencing referencing it but you know obviously this is the expansion um the cataphracts are arguably some of the best heavy cavalry in the game some of the eastern factions like the parthians and the armenians get them and they are badass these are very very heavily armored cavalry, uh, cavalry. you can see there these horses look like something out of the terminator man i mean they're like really jacked up proper metallic horses i mean they look something like out of the future basically what i'm saying is they're good and they're scary as well now for attack these ones are the um if i just check myself yeah so these guys attack of four nothing hugely amazing but the charge bonus of eight means actually they can hit quite significantly um if they are charged in the right angle probably from the back of like a spearman unit or something like that they can do a good amount of damage because the charge is fast and it'll, it, it will hit hard but the thing that i particularly like about these guys very well armored powerful charge 31 defense which is the highest number we've seen so far these guys once they get into the fray into the fight they're going to fight all day and they're going to be very very hard for units to take down so if you use these guys cleverly they can almost be an indestructible force purely because of this huge amount of armor they've got it's very very hard to take down these cataract units once you've just put them into the mix unless the opposition has some very very solid infantry particularly spearmen of their own so good good unit indeed any unit that is very well armoured is obviously going to be good. Then we get on to the Equites Clibonarii, the heaviest cavalry available to any Roman general. They are intended to batter enemy lines into submission. They are armed for melee, not for the charge. So the, this unit is more for that sort of like one-time charge, where if there's a vulnerable unit, maybe they're sort of shaken or wavering and you need that one charge to get them broken now at that moment. That's the units use. These guys are the more guys that are going to stand in for a while. But still, these guys can fight for a while. Don't underestimate them, that's for sure. But these guys, effective against armor. So this is more a cavalry that is used for late game troops. Um, so if your opposition has got some very, very high tech troops and you want to just get a unit in there that's going to fight all day and the high tech troops are not going to be able to do nothing against them, but you've got the armor to, the armor to defend yourself and also the ability to penetrate their armor very very solid troop indeed can form a wedge very very well armored i'm not going to repeat myself these guys are pretty damn good indeed now we're getting onto the general unit the imperial household bodyguard as they're called in this game obviously these guys are going to be good because their job is to protect the general so 11 attack 26 defense two hit points because of the general a charge bonus of six very very solid cavalry indeed very well armored much like the cataphracts uh, good stamina, good morale. It's going to be hard to break these guys down. It's going to be hard to kill the general if you use these guys properly. Obviously, be careful when charging in because you don't want to risk your general, but these guys can certainly do a good job. And considering you have access to them in the early game, whereas you won't have access to these guys in the early game, this is the best cavalry you're going to have for a long, long time. Now, Hippotoxotai. These are like, this is uh, horse archers, basically, is what that means, I believe. Toxotai means archers. So, in the base game of Rome Total War, the Romans do not have access to horse archers, unless through mercenaries, obviously. Uh, the closest they have is the javelin cav cavalry. They basically stole them off the Numidians, but whatever. So, so if you've watched, you know, my channel before, you probably know I'm a huge fan of horse archers. I think they're pretty OP, to be honest, because they're fast moving and they've got a pretty good missile attack. A missile attack of eight, which is pretty solid. It's like, you know, kind of comparable to these guys, um, but these these are much more maneuverable than the eastern archers they can just cause a lot of trouble man they can cause a lot of trouble a unit that is slow moving like a spearman unit can just be destroyed by these guys because they have no chance no chance of hitting the hippotox type if you're clever with them obviously if you charge straight into a spearman unit with the attack of five defense of 13 they're not really melee 
um, sort of oriented, then yeah, you're just a bit stupid if you do that. But if you use them properly, skirmish round units, they can be very, very annoying, which is good. And then Carriage Ballistae, again, another really cool unit. This is, well, pretty self-explanatory to be honest. It is an artillery piece on a horse. It doesn't get much more badass than that. So a missile attack of 21, because Ballista, which we'll have a look at in a second, Ballista, pretty damn cool. They have a high missile attack because it's a sort of machine, damn it. It's a machine, it's a big sort of archery machine that can do bolts and just smash the enemy, you know what I mean? So, attack of four, defense of eight. These guys aren't actually meant to be in the melee, but you'd be a bit stupid if you put them in the melee because they have such a good missile attack, you never need to. But these guys have a much longer range than the Hippotoxotai. Um, they have a much more devastating missile attack than the Hippotoxotai, and they're effective against armor, so they're gonna be more effective against late game troops. They can't hide, that's because it's a horse with a massive machine on its back. I, you know, can't blame them, to be honest. So now we're going to get onto the artillery, the siege equipment, whatever you want to call them, and we're going to start off with the Blistai. This is Blistai without a horse, so it's a little bit more disappointing, but obviously these guys are meant for attacking buildings, they can, you know, cause, um, they can penetrate certain walls. You've got to remember though, the walls in Barbarian Invasion are much bigger, generally much thicker, so these guys are going to be less effective than how they were in the base game, because generally speaking, it's going to take more to hit down a wall because the walls are going to be better. But they can actually do a very good attack against humans as well. They are easily capable of passing straight through a target and skewering another man too. Love it. So they can impale several men like I said. Long range missiles, can use flaming missiles and can't hide. Then we get on to the scorpions. Again, I've talked about these in my Rome Total War Faction Guide in a lot of detail. I think it was a Skippy Eye Guide I talked about the uh, siege equipment in detail. Um, they are a sinew powered weapon that looks like a large bow laid sideways on a frame and has a tremendous range and can skewer a man with a single shot. There's pretty much all that needs to be said about it. A pretty good melee, uh, sorry, missile attack on people. Defense isn't amazing, but that's not what they're really meant for. These, these cannot um, penetrate walls though, so they are completely ineffective in that regard as a piece of sort of siege equipment in terms of breaking down walls. Then we have repeating ballista. Ingenious hand cranked artillery weapons. As long as they are kept supplied with bolts and the crew kept working, they will send out a stream of deadly missiles. This is the closest to a machine gun you're going to get in there, or like, like a Gatling gun that you're going to get in Rome Total War. So, obviously, they're pretty cool. Long range missiles can impale several men, but these guys are ineffective against walls and buildings, unlike the normal ballista. Then we go on to onagers. Now, onagers are much more better at dealing with walls. They are not the most accurate thing. They have, like it says here, more area attack. That's why they're less effective against people, I find, in general, because they're not particularly accurate. If you're aiming for a specific unit with onagers, particularly when they have the flaming missile effect, you're very unlikely to hit that unit, if I'm being perfectly honest. Um, but against buildings, they can hit a wall and they'll do a good job in bringing it down. And then you have the heavy onagers, basically a better version, is what I'm gonna say, but again, inaccurate against troops. So that is the Eastern Roman Empire units. Quite a cool mix, quite a cool army indeed. In the early game, yeah, okay, the Limitane might be a bit disappointing, but actually in the late game, you've got some pretty damn solid units indeed. So it kind of makes up. The cavalry is a particularly good part of the late game where you can just sort of dominate your opponents, in my opinion. So now we're going to get onto some campaign strategy. Let's see how it goes. So this is the campaign map for the Eastern Roman Empire. Now you might wonder why I have the, the uh, Fog of War off. The reason is I don't play with the Fog of War off normally. I, I never play with the Fog of War off, but it's easier just to show you what's around, what's nearby, if you can actually see what the hell's going on. So wouldn't, I don't want anyone to think I'd normally play with the Fog of War off. It's purely for demonstrating purposes. It's much easier to show you what's going on. Now you get greeted when you go into this screen with a storm from the east it's basically warning you about the huns and the horde factions so you know be wary and the people in flight the vandals so the huns and the vandals start off as hordes a little bit scary and then a powerful faith paganism is becoming the majority religion and we'll talk about religion in just a second so and like i said when i was starting off the video this is the area and you have quite a lot read how many regions do you start off with you start off with 17 so you need 34 to complete the campaign you're really halfway there but obviously keeping those regions is going to be the difficulty in the early game particularly. So you have settlements like Constantinople, which is a very strong one. It's the capital. It's got some, well, it's already got some large stone walls. It's got the capacity to build, if we have a look. It has the capacity to build, yeah, Legio Lanciari, I say build, recruit. Legio Lanciari, uh, Lanciari, however the hell you say that. So, you know, 
already you don't have to worry about Limitane because you've got something better, which is cool. I like that. Uh, and then we have Thessalonica and Syra, various other, I won't go through all of them, stretching down through Cadonia over to the Egyptian provinces over here. So, in terms of enemies around you, we have the Goths to the north, which is a barbarian faction. The Sarmatians, although technically not bordering you, can be a problem if they turn into a horde. We'll talk about that a bit more in the beginning, uh, sorry, later as well. The Sassanids are probably one of the main problems because they are straight to your east, and I believe you're already at war with them. Yeah, you're already at war with the Sassanids, so they're going to be they're going to be fighting against you pretty quickly. And then. On, over this side, to the west, you have the Western Roman Empire, which are technically allies, but they can be very, very unpredictable, very, very disloyal. They are allies in the loosest sense that you could possibly imagine. Really, they are probably going to attack you at some point, so you need to be prepared for that. But probably not any early, early game is what I would imagine. So, what to start off with? Well, we're going to start off with public order and just consolidating the empire because the the sort of elephant in the room that I haven't really address, addressed much yet is religion and now the your emperor where is your emperor he should be in constantinople yes he is valens flavius he's a christian valens flavius is christian but you will see that some of your settlements for example thessalonica athens kidonia and Syra. Quite a few, in fact, are pagan, which is going to cause a bit of conflict. And you can see the Christian settlements, they're great. Constantinople is chilling. Ephesus is having a good time. But these guys are a bit angry because they're pagan and because their emperor is not. So what do you want to do? Well, there's, there's a couple of methods, but really there is the one best method. We'll talk about that in a second. The short-term method is to go through each settlement and say, right, some are, some are definitely going to be Christian. So the Constantinople and Ephesus ones, but other ones like Athens, you tear down the Christian buildings and you say, right, take out the Christian governor. We're going to go full on pagan and they'll be happy because it's pagan and it's all fine in the short term. Now, you can argue that's good because it's going to save you money in the short term. It's less expensive um, than the option that I'm just about to tell you, the longer term option. And happiness will be better at the beginning. But there is a longer term solution which costs more money, but in the long run will be the better one, I assure you. And it's the one I would recommend. And that is to convert all the settlements to Christianity. It takes a while, it can be a bit of a slog, and it can be difficult, but it is totally worth it, trust me. So what you do is you take down all the pagan temples and all of that. You have to lower taxes in settlements like Athens and Thessalonica because they're going to be unhappy. But over time, you increase the Christianity because your emperor is Christian, so that's important. And eventually, they will turn to Christianity, and then they will have the same faith as your emperor. Hopefully, they will do anyway. And they should be happier. It takes a while, though. Now, the advantages to this, well, they'll have the same faith as the emperor, so over time, they will be happier. And you can then go back to raising taxes as well. Most of your governors are Christian, so um, that helps. It means you can have a governor in a region and not worry that he's going to get killed or have public order issues because he's in that region. And also, if all of the regions are the same, then they're more likely to influence each other positively in terms of being Christian. If you have settlements next to each other, like Ephesus and Ansira, what you can have is a mix of religions because one may be influencing the other but in a sort of polarising way, which can cause trouble to both. So rather than having... having two happy settlements, you've got two sort of mediocre settlements, which is not what you want. So my advice would be convert to Christianity. That's what you've got to do. It takes a while. It is worth it. Now, in terms of the military, the more interesting stuff, in my opinion, what do you do? Well, I wouldn't worry too much about the Western Roman Empire at the beginning. They're going to have their own troubles. Trust me. We'll talk about that next uh, next time about the, the Western Roman Empire. They're probably not going to be worrying about you too much in the early, early game. And the main worries are the hordes in the north, so the Goths, the Sarmatians, sorry, the Hordes, the Barbarian Factions in the North, the Sarmatians, the Roxolani, less so Roxolani, Sarmatians, Goths, Huns will be coming down, the Vandals will be coming down, the, the Huns and the Vandals should be, there's the Vandals, and there's the Huns. Now, they're going to be coming down and wrecking havoc, and they're most likely going to be coming straight from your empire, 
coming down here. And what they could do is they could trigger other hordes as well. So if they kill off the Sarmatians, then the Sarmatians will trigger a horde. Then you've got another horde that is likely to come down towards you. So how do you deal with that? Well, it's difficult to actually go on the offensive against the Barbarians early on. I wouldn't recommend it. I would go on the defensive. Have this sort of northern border as a defensive line. And the good thing about this northern border is that you can see there are several bridges. One, two, three, four bridges. So what I would do, set up armies on the bridges. Set up all the armies you can. You know, you don't have to recruit a huge amount because you've got several field armies out here like uh, this one over here, Captain Asinius. You can bring a general on, along to join him as well. You have Manius Flavius over here. Block up the bridges and what you'll find is the barbarians will throw themselves at the bridges and... If you've ever played Rome Total War, you'll know that defending on a bridge is pretty easy, to be honest. You've got, if the, the, the Limitani actually might be a bit useful in that one instance, um, just to block up the bridge. You have archers, you know, this uh, this army has some eastern archers already, combat tenses are pretty solid. Just chuck the, chuck the arrows across the bridge and you'll be able to ho hold the bridges, most likely, against the hordes and hordes of barbarian barbarians basically so if you fight them out in the open field not on bridges you're going to have a tougher time but just because of the sheer quantity you are going to be outnumbered but the one place really that it doesn't matter if you are outnumbered is on a bridge that is why i would recommend don't go any further than the bridges set up on the bridges play it defensively they will throw their force at you but eventually they have no more force to throw left and at that point in a sort of mid game then you can start expanding north or more likely into northern italy against the, Ro the western roman empire it is over this side where I would go on the offensive against the Sassanids. Cotes is quite a cool one to take early on, but there's a nice rebel settlement. Um, but it just, you can destroy the Sassanids fairly quickly. Although they have a decent sized empire, it looks big. It's actually only five settlements. My, my advice would just be sweep across uh, the Sassanids because they have got some pretty strong units. Now, infantry-wise, they're not amazing, but cavalry, they have got some very, very strong cavalry. You do not want them to tech up particularly, and you want to just deal with the cav before they have got too much of it, okay? It's sort of damage limitation. Just get rid of them early on is my advice. So I wouldn't worry too much about taking rebel settlements. I would pile my force from Egypt along from um, the sort of Turkey region, Caesarea region, into the Sassanids, Focus your force on those guys and go on the offensive and just eliminate them. Then it's good because you have a sort of natural barrier here where th there's a void of darkness. And then it means that you can focus more where you'll need to against the Western Roman Empire and the Barbarians later on. So that's my general advice basically. I've talked for long enough is convert to Christianity, hold the Barbarian factions in the north and then go on the offensive against the Sassanids. So anyway, that is pretty much all from me today. Thank you very much for watching. I'll be back with faction guides for all the barbarian invasion factions. So we'll be doing the Western Roman Empire next. That'll be an interesting one, that's for sure. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you around.